There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Welcome, Sandra. Hello, welcome. So nice to meet you. And I've discovered I didn't know why you were my Goodreads friend. And now that we've been <laughs> chatting for a few minutes, it turns out that you've been a long-term subscriber of my booktube channel. How lovely. Um, nice to meet you. It's, yeah, it's great to meet you. And you have recently read a book that's on my shelf beckoning to me that I haven't yet read. And that is We Are All Birds of Uganda by Hafsa Zayan. And yes. you quite liked it. So tell us why. I'm always interested in stories of um, like colonization, the effect of colonization and immigration and the generational effect that has and in generational grief um, and the feeling of not belonging. So not being a part of one culture or the other. So any story, it doesn't matter where it's set in the world. I'm really drawn to narratives like that. I have um, a background where I'm first generation Latvian. So, you know, my family had that kind of story, even though I look white, I am white, obviously, but I have a generation where I, my country was, you know, invaded. Um, we, we have fe close family who were killed in the Second World War. My mum had to walk with her parents off her farm. So I understand the dislocation, even being brought up in Australia and fitting the book there's a part of my culture that can never be met in this country, even though I've taken on a lot of the culture of this country. So I understand that kind of disconnection in, in a person. So it does say, so, like I said, I'm really open to those type of narratives. And so that's what drew me to this book because I thought, oh, I don't know anything about Uganda. And, oh, I didn't know the Indians got kicked out. And what, why were they in the, there in the first place? It was because of British colonisation. And I just like to see the interplay of that in, in the generation that was affected and the generation that follows. This ticked all the Sandra book boxes. Yeah, yeah. And it was and it's good because I mean we all read for different reasons. And I like, I mean, I like learning about the world through books because it's, you know, you you find a fictional narrative, but then you become interested in that history. You know, I wasn't really aware of that Indian um, you know, in Uganda and the fact that they got kicked out with Idi Amin and all that. It wasn't part of something I was probably aware of on the peripheral, but not something that was really salient in my upbringing in Australia. So I see yeah. there's two timelines. One is 1960s Uganda and the other is present day London. So yes, tell us a bit right. about what's going on in those. Uh, we're not, obviously not going to go into spoilers, but tell, set those yeah. two timelines up for so, us. Um, it actually starts off with a letter in the 1960 narrative. And I read, the, I read an interview where the that was the first um, part that the author wrote and she submitted it into this prize. Um, her husband is actually Indian Ugandan or African Ugandan. So that she's actually, I think, Pakistan and Nigerian. Uh -huh. um, but so anyway, so oh, she- Oh, you know, oh, her, oh really? Oh, that's, yeah. that's fascinating. So she actually doesn't have any Ugandan heritage. Right, so her husband. Her and husband, she was oh. like, oh, she wanted to write a book about, you know, immigration. And he goes, well, what about my family's history? So, so she started with this letter, which is uh, the husband is writing to his deceased wife. Um, he's Asian in Uganda. He has he's been forced to remarry because that's just a culture. And, you know, the family set him up with another wife. And so he's writing this letter onto her about- you know, it's, it's, it's his love for her, but it's also um, talking about his what's happening in the time and how, you know, they, they've, they have this family business. It's like about two or three generations, Saeed and Sons. It's like a just a general store kind of thing. And he's just talking about, you know, the things that are happening in the family and the things that are happening um, in the country. But he is very naive. So he was brought, born in Uganda. So he has this great faith that he is Ugandan, that his, you know, his family have been really successful there. So he believes this will always be the case. And he is still under British rule at the beginning of the letter. Um, and then it goes to modern day London and you meet Samir, who's actually his grandson. Okay. And he's, you know, this young lawyer, really successful, very diligent, works really hard, but there is a disconnect. It looks like the world is his oyster kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of the high, you know, executives at law firm are patting him on the back because he does work like almost 24 hour days, it seems like, with ridiculous hours he puts in for the firm. So he's doing all the right things. 
He hasn't really got much of a social life. He's just got these two friends that are from Leicester. So he was born in Leicester. His parents' grandfather immigrated to Leicester when he came from Uganda. So his family home's in Leicester. So he's got these two friends who are also, you know, diverse background, Rahul and Jeremiah. And they're both all living in London with different careers and they sort of knock out on the weekends. But things happen and things change in that narrative. And you can see, even though Samir looks like everything's going well, he starts to pick up microaggressions and, you know, avert racism at work because they realise he's Muslim and they start to say, oh, you, oh, we didn't invite you to this party because even though he's on the team because we know you don't drink alcohol. And, you know, they just make all these assumptions about him. So he starts to feel this tension mm-hmm. and he goes home to visit and there's always this pressure of him to come home. And even though they, they educated him in Cambridge, you know, the family want him home to run the business. So he's got all these type of pressures. When I read uh, novels that have two timelines, one of the things that often, not always, but a significant amount of the time happens is that I like one of the timelines or I'm more engaged by yeah. one of the timelines than the other. So did, how, did you find them both equally engaging? Did I think I realised that they were telling me different perspectives. So I probably liked Samir's a little bit more mm. because obviously could relate to it a bit more. But I still felt what the grandfather was saying, and you could. And it, what I like about this story is it shows racism from all perspectives. It's not just like white. It's also you know the Indians. They thought they were better than the Africans in Uganda because they were, you know, the chosen ones of the the British colonizers, and they did more. They financially succeeded more mm. um, than the native people. But the native people were resentful because they thought, well, they were given the leg up, like they were given the help. So there's this tension between Indian and and Ugandan people as well. So and you see how the grandfather has this sense of entitlement. You still see there's a bit of us and them kind of thing. Interesting. Um, Would you describe this more as a character-driven novel or a plot-driven novel? I would say character because I'm really not a plot. I okay, kind of read good, plot, me too. I'm more of a character-driven it, reader. Stupid, that'll just drop my, like I will drop a star for a bad plot. Like, do you know what I mean? When plot, or not plot, or plot gets away from itself. Right. There is definitely plot in it, but it's, to me, it was more looking at, the grandfather's coping with what was ha- going to happen to him and the change in his lifestyle. And then how Samia, again, was in a successful position but but had to work out where who he was and he had to, and, you know, go back to his past to work that out. So I saw that there was a journey in both of them that was more character but was definitely had plot behind it. Okay, very interesting. So just to uh, wrap this up, we're going to do a, a very unusual, something I've never done on Bite Size Book Chats. We have the same hardcover copy. I want you to pick yours up yeah. and I want yeah. you to take a deep sniff of the front cover dust jacket. Do you smell anything? No. <laughs> Mine has i bought it new came in the mail and then i I filmed a book haul video where i talked about it and then i just kind of smelled it and and it has a it's a little bit weaker now but uh, at that time especially but i can still smell it it has a really kind of perfumed scent that i wondered if if it was intentionally there was some kind of aroma therapeutic (laughs) going on with a dust jacket but yours doesn't have it not really, but I mean, I'm, you know, it might have lost its smell. Yeah, and mine's actually a bit, a bit muted from what it was about six months ago when I filmed that yeah, book. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> I asked another booktuber, Eric Carl Anderson, to sniff his, and he, he didn't come up with anything. So very interesting. Uh-huh. Well, Sandra, this is great. You have uh, made gotten it. My it's getting bumped higher to the top of my TV yeah. pile, yeah. thanks to you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I hope that you will come back. Well, this is very special to welcome Lindy for, for her debut appearance, not on my channel. She's been here almost as much as I have been, but uh, on my Bite Size Book Chat series. Welcome, Lindy, from Edmonton. Hi, Sean. Nice to be here. Lindy and I keep in very close touch on Voxer. We are very close bookish friends. So you have been raving about this new Canadian debut novel called Molly Falls to Earth by Maria Much. And among my friends, you're the only one that's read it. 
and it doesn't have that high of a Goodreads rating, which probably means it's an excellent book. <laughs> Sell it to us, girlfriend. All right. So Molly is a dance choreographer mm. in New York City, modern dance, and she has epilepsy, which she keeps a secret from most people except her husband. Sometimes she has just little mini seizures and people around her tend to think she's just a little bit spacey, but really it's because she's just had a, a small, a tiny seizure. And occasionally she has a big one. And this whole book takes place in seven minutes. Oh. She's outdoors on the sidewalk near Washington Park and falls down with the seizure. And then it's what happens. Images come to her from the really important or vivid moments of her life. And so, you know, it's kind of like in flashbacks of things that have happened. And there's also a crowd of bystanders, bystanders around her phoned for medical help who are, you know, saying like, what should we do? Um, and in addition to that, there's another sort of through narrative about, uh, it's a documentary about missing persons. Mm. And so we get little snippets as if it's a conversation on a documentary, people talking about someone from their life who's gone missing and they can't find them. And there is a person in Molly's past who went missing and his sister is looking, has been looking for him and it's been a decade or so um, that she hasn't given up hope that they're gonna figure out what happened to him. Hmm. So there's all these different elements and I love um, novels that are told in fragments like hmm. that, lots of sort of kaleidoscopic pieces. And this is just, brilliantly crafted the writing is fantastic you know I just I, I'm the kind of person who flags passages when I like the way something is said you know and this book was just like full of flags I was like oh 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 <laughs> yeah it's a fairly new novel just came out in this spring right uh -huh. and she's yeah. a Canadian writer I don't know anything I've never heard of her she wrote a collection of short stories. And she also had, um, I think it was a memoir. I didn't read it. Know the Night. Yes, yes, that's right. Which won a Governor General Award. Okay. Really. I think she lives part of the time in Canada and part of the time in the US. And she's a visual artist. And this book is also got, it's got a brilliant design. There's a lot of attention paid to different fonts. And it does actually help to keep track because there's so many things going on. So the, the font is also a clue um, of what, you know, where you're being transported to. And there's photographs. Okay. So like, for example, and most of them are uh, just trees, the sidewalk, um, a park bench. Do they and, correspond to where she has fallen on this on the sidewalk? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They work together with the narrative really well. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, d missing persons narrative, that was, uh, was that her, a friend of her sister's that had gone missing? It was a man that she had an affair with before she got married. Who went missing. And who went missing. Oh, okay. And that man's sister who Molly also knows, that man's sister has been searching for him. So that connects the main character and that missing story much more closely than I was. I was worried that it would not be connected. And you're already assuring me that everything fits together beautifully. Yes. But I don't like it when there's two story strands that I can't really see what's the connection between the two. But now that you've clarified, now that I understand that part of it, yeah, okay, so that should, that should work. Now, the first few reviews that come up on Goodreads are five stars, but it's got a 3.29 rating. So why do you think that several readers don't like it? And why, what would you say to them? 
<laughs> the thing is, not every book is for every reader. Right. This is a, a book for people who love language and for people who are interested in the way that we connect to other people. Well, that's definitely um, a strong theme in here about how, you know, it might just be a, a, a bystander who sees you have a seizure, but your illness touches them. Their day is changed. Maybe their life is changed. We don't know that, but it's not just the people that we're close to, but even people that are, you know, removed by sometimes many degrees that we still affect with our lives on earth. And especially in a city where there's, you know, there's just so many people around all the time. There are some characters in here that are homeless. They have their own concerns and uh, habits. And, you know, this is what they do at this time. And, you know, they see Molly when she's going about her business. There are the dancers that she works with. She has children. She has a couple of twins. Have you read Elif Shafak's 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world? No, I haven't, but I have an idea that about because it, I know about it. Resonates. It, yeah, yeah, I haven't read it either. But And then what about Joyce Carol Oates' Blackwater? Oh. It's based on the Chappaquiddick incident. Senator Ted Kennedy he drove his car he, into, the, into the river and his volunteer whatever young lady died drowned and he kind of walked away the names are changed but the, the protagonist she's drowning in the car and she's reliving her life and it's powerful so that those two one of which i've read the other uh, i haven't sounds like you know that kind of a story i'm especially interested in um elise shafak's novel because i have read other books by her and really enjoyed them mm. and i'm sure that i would like uh 10 minutes and how many seconds? Seconds, I've already forgotten how many, but yeah. Right. And which <laughs> is know. about the soul leaving the body, I think. Right. It's about, yeah. a, I think, the murdered prostitute in Turkey. Yeah. yeah. She, as the life is leaving her body, she's kind of reliving her. Yeah. And you are on, uh, are you on the Shadow Giller again this year? Yeah, I am. And yes. you have both of your, all set of five set of fingers crossed that this, this book. Um, Molly Falls to Earth. Yeah. On the on the, on the Giller long list. Yeah, I'm I'm confident that this will be on the long list. Okay. Yeah. Well, you and I are going to be doing a deep dive into the long list, so everybody out there, stay tuned for that. But for now, you I think you've sold quite a few of my subscribers on this particular book, so thank you very much. You're welcome. I would like to welcome a uh, litzy friend of mine from days gone by, Margo. Welcome to my channel, Margo. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. Now, it's great to have you. And I'd say where you're from, but that's a little complicated um, question. So I'll let you describe yeah. that however you'd like to. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm in transition after 22 years in the United States. Uh, I'm moving back with my family to New Brunswick in Canada. So. Yeah, so fellow Canuck, but on the opposite side. Yes, that's right. After a maritimer. 20, maritimer after 22 years. That's a long, <laughs> long time. So good yeah. luck with all that. Thank you. So you have recently read a novel that I'd never heard of. I'd vaguely heard of the no of the author, but I'd never heard of this novel. A Big Storm Knocked It Over by Laurie Colwyn. Mm -hmm. You quite liked it. Yeah. So Laurie Colwyn, I didn't know much about her before the summer, I knew she was a food writer. And then I discovered she wrote novels and I kind of bumped up a couple of people talking about them and uh, what she's known for is writing happy novels. And I thought, oh, I maybe I'm in the mood for a happy novel. So I've read two of her books this summer. So this is the second one that I've read by her. I usually poo-poo the idea of a happy novel, but uh, I know. I, uh, but you know, yes. <laughs> but well, I do too. That's I. Right. You know. But yeah. this one worked for you. Maybe I'm just in the mood for a happy novel too. But yeah, there's not really like a plot, and so I, you know, I like that. I like. I tend to prefer a more character-driven story. Okay, me too. And, and the main character is this woman named Jane Louise, and when we start the book, she's just gotten married. 
Um, what I can tell so far about Laurie Colwin's novels is the characters are like rich New Yorkers or rich adjacent New Yorkers. <laughs> so she works in like book design and she's just gotten married. So the story is really like very episodic. It's just these small moments in her life. At the same time, there's three big events, which is she gets married and then she gets pregnant and then she has a baby. And it's just like, when she thinks about those events, she thinks she's very stressed and anxious. But then you have all these moments of her just living her life, like having interactions with her coworker Sven or talking about catering with her best friend Edie. Um, and even though she's always worried about things, she then kind of realizes that there are just moments to life that are quite happy and enjoyable, so. And that sounds like it wouldn't be everybody's cup of tea and it may not be mine, but it certainly sounds uh, interesting enough that I want to try. And Laurie Colwin, I had never really, she was, I knew the name, but she died so young. She just dropped out of a heart attack at the age of 48. Yeah. 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 And she has this like, um, I, cult might be strong, but she seems to have this like very fervent following of people who like, love her novels and when I came upon her I was like oh it's so weird but apparently they are republishing all her novels which is I think why I bumped up against a couple of discussions and that is what led me to her but yeah I agree I feel like it's in the zone of chiclet which is a term like you know I use problematic used, term yeah problematic term but the characters are so nuanced I guess that you there's something very human and gentle and kind about it all. Would you say that the stories are sentimental? No, I don't. I got, See, that's I the thing. If it's not sentimental, I think <laughs> I would like it. Yeah, I mean, feel good. Anything that's feel good, like I immediately, like I, I hate feeling manipulated in that sort of way. Right, right, right. Um, and I don't think that's what this is. I okay. think it's just moments of, happiness and pleasure <laughs> so it's almost like tinged with kind of a proustian kind of remembrance of things past kind of vibe. maybe yeah i mean like it was funny when i was thinking about how do i talk about this book and right. it's like in some ways it's like exactly what you tell writers not to do which is like only frame it around this like gigantic event right marriage baby pregnant pregnancy baby but then like below that are just like these small moments with very interesting, strange characters, like. And the oh, uh, strange characters. Well, quirky, interesting. Quirky. Characters, and you know? the tone is light. serious, light, kind of shifting between those two poles. Yeah, I mean, I think it's mostly light. I mean, Jane Louise in this novel is anxious. And so there is a little bit of her anxiety running through it. But then she keeps like nobody else is anxious like there there is no need for this anxiety all the time so that's what she keeps kind of discovering well the fact that there isn't a whole bunch that happens and the characters are really nuanced has sold me so that sounds great now th uh, this is her fifth and final novel published posthumously what was the first one you read by her I think it's called happy all the time you like that one as well uh, yes and it's again like it's about relationships. It's, you know, there's no plot. <laughs> she has intriguing titles. What's this one called again? <laughs> a Big Storm Knocked It Over. Is it a very rigorous admission process to get into the Lori Colwyn I don't know. <laughs> society? <laughs> I don't know. I think you, you know, I just, I don't know. I'm not sure that I'm in it yet, but like, <laughs> well. I'm, I'm trying to read my way through and it's, I guess maybe in the midst of my move and my chaos, it's like nice to just hang That's out in the world and people thing. are happy. <laughs> How many novels did she write? I think she wrote about five. Yeah. And there's a couple of collections of short stories, oh. Oh. I think. Yeah. I see there's um, she's got quite a list here on Goodreads. But she's most famous for her cooking. Like she used to write for Gourmet Magazine. Um, and so the, and there's lots of like scenes of food, like meals are very detailed in the novel. Like when people have feasts and stuff. So I'm probably going to get hungry while I'm reading it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was like one scene I was like, wow, that's like quite a feast. So yeah, there is food. So yeah, it's fun. I mean, I, 
I guess I'm cautious recommending it to you because I <laughs> feel like it is in a zone that my sense of your reading taste is pretty serious and my reading taste is generally pretty serious in the like literary. Yep. So that's of... why I, I, the recommendation coming from you rather than somebody who only reads quote unquote chiclet. I, yeah. I yeah. Definitely want to try it. So this yeah. is great, Margot. Good luck with your move. I hope that you will you. become one of my uh, transplanted Canadian participants in Bite Size yeah. Book Chats after you get settled there. Yeah, and thanks that. for coming on and I am absolutely delighted to have a long-term subscriber and commenter on my channel here for a bite-sized book chat, Abilash from Kerala, India. Welcome, Abilash. Thanks a lot, uh, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. You have been such a great active subscriber. This is uh, exciting to finally sit down face to face, not quite face to face, but as close as it's going to get for a while. You're a widely read, very literary reader. And the one that jumped out on your recent reads that I would like you to tell us about is a novel by W.G. Sebald, The Emigrants, translated by Michael Hulse, which is about Jewish emigres in the 20th century. Tell us why yeah. you liked it. Sabal, I came to Sabal after reading Enigma of Arrival by Nabal. Never read anything like that before. Yeah, so it didn't have a plot, and it was a plain kind of a story and about someone stuck at some place and uh, contemplating. So uh, then I I started searching for a similar writer. So in Goodreads, I I guess you can search for a similar. All those kind of things. So yeah, those something like that. So then I came across uh, Sibald. Immigrants is a, a four-part novel. Uh, it's about four different people. Uh, so the thing about Sibald is Sibald is always uh, writing about history, the way memory works. Uh, is influenced by Thomas Bernard. Uh, so, uh, he uses that kind of a technique, but his tech, uh, his writing style is. Is totally different from Bernard. Um, he's, uh, he has a more poetic language, uh, if you ask me, more literary language. Uh, uh, I don't know in your scale where it uh, stands, but yeah. Well, I'm, I, to... <laughs> I, I'm interested to hear your take on his prose. It's described in the Goodreads synopsis as dreamlike. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about dreamlike. It has an arresting quality to it, uh, and I can I can share some links. There's a YouTube video uh, where he talks about his influences. So he uses photographs in it. Yes, exactly, and um, I, I, yeah. So that's a back, there's a backstory to it. I wanted to tell you that also. Um, he never mentions Holocaust in any of his stories and any of his four novels. He doesn't mention Holocaust, but we can we can sense it. So, for example, in Rings of Saturn, there's a passage where he talks about silkworms uh, and how the worms are put in hot water to extract the silk. Uh, it kind of refers to, you know, the Holocaust and those things. So we can, so he presents it in a nice way, uh, so that we can understand what really uh, he's alluding to. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things are there. So in immigrants, it's slightly straightforward. He talks about four people, four isolated people, lonely people uh, who are talking about their stories. I always talk into a narrator. The story I wanted to talk about was the last one, uh, Max Weber, uh, who evolved. It's in Manchester. Mm -hmm. uh, so Manchester was the industrial city and uh, the, there was a lot of immigrant population there. So he meets him and this guy is a painter who applies a lot of paint to uh, canvas first, then scrapes it off to create a painting. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's how they meet. And he again meets uh, him after, uh, when, when the narrator is in his 50s. So after 20, 30 years, I guess. So then uh, Heber talks, him, uh, talks to him about uh, the Nazi Germany, uh, how his uh, family suffered. So they, his parents um, had some influence. So they managed to send him off to London uh, to his uncle. So when he reached London, uh, then then he hands over uh, a diary 
uh, a journal uh, to to Sebal, which belonged to his mom. So uh, then Sebal goes on to describe what is written in the journal, which kind of takes us uh, back to his mom, you know, Febal's mom's childhood and uh, to her, till her marriage or something. So it, uh, they describe the daily life, uh, how it goes on and on. Uh, it ends with a brilliant, uh, yeah, so like you mentioned, the photograph thing. Uh, this is a photograph that are uh, with uh, three ladies in it and they're all looking at the uh, camera. So mm. Sebal feels like they are looking at him. So That's it's very interesting. Fun. Yeah. Now, you know my me as a reader quite well. I need to feel an emotional connection with the story. Do you think, and I keep hearing about Seabald that he's more intellectual than emotional. Would you agree? Do you think this is a Sean book? I think it's a Sean book. Um, it, it's not an intellectual uh, nonsense. You can really relate to it, I, especially the last scene, right? It, I, I wanted to read the book again just for that uh, that page yeah, because it's always nice to read uh, that quality literature, you know. And there was an article in uh, New Yorker by Andrea Simon. Uh, you know the writer, right? Call me by your name. Uh, oh, those yeah. Are your, no, yeah. yeah. So, Not a yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I also didn't like the novel much. No. I like the movie. Yeah, I like the movie. But Asiman is really good uh, when he writes nonfiction. Okay. So his memoir, Out of Egypt, is one of the uh, most mind-blowing books uh, I've read uh, in recent years. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Uh, he wrote an article about Sebal in New Yorker, where he talks about immigrants, a story about his grandmother. And this story was more like what... Um, Sebal uh, said, uh, described in um, in a Max Weber story, where he talks about his mom. So this uh, friend of Asim and thought, uh, actually Sebal knows these people. Uh, and he wanted to uh, get in touch with Sebal. So he wrote a letter to Sebal and Sebal wrote him back saying, no, I didn't know any of these people. This is pure fiction. But uh, it kind of matched with their story. And that was an interesting thing. So uh, he wrote about it in, in New York as a man. Um, That's fascinating. So, so you read the article in the New Yorker first? He, uh, no, actually, I had read uh, the book back in 2012 itself. This article came out in 2016. Okay. So do you recommend somebody read, the, anybody who's interested, should they read the article first and then the book or vice versa? Uh, you can do it either way. Uh, it's well, fascinating since you know it. Yeah. It's fascinating anyway. Well, so I will, I will yeah, no, I can also uh, make you a fan of Asiman's uh, nonfiction. Well, that would be quite something because I'm certainly not a fan of his overly <laughs> sentimental uh, yeah. fiction. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. And I'm going to put a link to that article in the show notes because uh, that sounds yeah, cool. uh, Well, I shall check. Th- I will start with this one then and I will let you know how it goes. Thank you for telling us about it, Abilash. Not a problem.